Okay, and this is Cheryl Elser. Okay, hello everybody. Um, my name is Cheryl Elser. Um, I'm a former educator, and in good educator ways, I am using Comic Sans to start. I will not use Comic Sans after this slide because I think Comic Sans should not always be used. But anyway, just starting with Comic Sans. Um, and um, I wanted to start off um, just by saying I actually really hate periods. When I was uh, 13 years old, um, I remember being the last person on my cheer squad to start my period. And I really, really wanted to be like everyone else and be able to like, be like, oh, I have cramps. Oh, I need to go get a tampon. Why? I don't know. I wanted to be like everyone else, I guess. But little did I know that my journey as a person who would have periods every month. And I know that can be a privilege because there's some people who, who don't, um, would turn into something that I, I did not realize would be a really hard part of my life. Um, because we never talked about it, I had um, really, really heavy periods. And um, I had to use multiple forms of menstruation products so that I wouldn't bleed everywhere. I later found out that I had something called uterine fibroids, which is higher in black women, but no one ever talked about it. This led to my infertility. And so for me, I'm really happy that we're doing this today because we have to talk about the hard things. And there are a lot of women, girls, where this subject is taboo. So once upon a time, <laughs> I wanted to be a school principal. I don't want to be a school principal anymore, but I did. <laughs> and um, I thought to myself, you know, I taught school for seven years. I taught in Maryland, Philly, and DC. And I was um, working at the Utah State Board of Education. And I thought to myself, why don't I go get my administrative license? And when I was getting my administrative license, um, I had to do an internship on, in elementary and one in secondary. And in elementary, I, I made it a point to find a mentor that was a black principal, which at the time, there were, at the time, four in the whole state. But I found her, and I was like, one of them. And I, and I, I was a mentee under her. And then my secondary um, internship was done at East High School. I specifically chose East High School because it was a school that was majority students of color. So I'm gonna to try to do some educating for you all today. If there's anything that I want you to get out of today, please stop using the word minority. Please stop that. Let's call it what it is. It's majority students of color. When we're looking at the census, people of color are rising in numbers, especially mixed race kids, um, and when we use the word minority, it denotes um, less than, okay? So this is a school that has more students of color than white students. It was 51% to 49%. But I wanted to be an intern there, and I thought it was really interesting because they had a food pantry there. Now, food pantries are something that we're seeing a lot more now in high schools, but at the time, that wasn't the case. We would have schools from all around the nation coming to learn about East High School and what they were doing. And um, in, this, in these pantries, we realized um, that this was a need, that food pantries and product pantries are increasing because the disparities are increasing. And when we look at Utah, it's the fourth fastest growing state today, in 2021, okay? Um, but looking at our data here, 
um, and why this matters, all of this in education, is currently we have 1,287 schools in Utah. Um, sorry, the latest data is from school year 20. I worked at the State Board of Education, so we like always have to wait for some data. But looking at school year 20, and 348 of those schools are Title I schools, and 97 are charter schools. This is really important to understand. A lot of times people get charter schools confused, and they don't understand that they, they are also public schools because they're publicly funded. So I really love that this initiative is not um, forgetting charter schools because they also can receive Title I funds. So again, I'm trying to educate you all a little bit, and, and what does this mean? So when we're looking at the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, um, this was originally signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson in 1965 to provide federal funding to assist schools that serve high numbers or high percentages of students from low-income families. Since then, ESEA has been reauthorized by Congress several times. In 2001, many of you might have known it as No Child Left Behind. Um, in December of 2015, ESEA was reauthorized and signed into law as the Every Student Succeeds Act. So if you're wanting to sound cool around educators, you're just like, have you read ESSA? Okay, call it ESSA. You sound really good. And ESEA, um, as amended by ESSA, goes into effect beginning with the 2017-2018 school year, or it did go into effect then. So again, what does this mean? When we're looking at Title I, Part A of um, ESSA, this is a program that provides financial assistance each year to local education agencies, or LEAs. So again, just gonna educate you. LEAs can be a school, they can be a district. So when we're thinking about LEAs, sometimes we, we really consider it to be a district or a charter school. I worked for the SEA, or the State Education Agency, at the Utah State Board of Education. So anyway, a program that provides financial assistance each year to local education agencies and schools with high numbers or high percentages of children from low-income families to help ensure that all students have the equitable opportunities to meet challenging state academic standards. Funds are used to provide supplemental educational services and resources to meet the needs of economically and educationally disadvantaged students. Okay, so a lot of schools have what we call Title I funds. When we looked at my former data, it was 348 schools in the state of Utah that received those funds. So again, what does this mean? For a school to qualify for Title I funds, the percent of low-income children in the school must be at least 35%, and LEAs must provide Title I services to all schools with 75% or greater poverty. That's 27% of our schools in Utah. So that you understand. So this is also something to understand. Many of our Title I funds go to our elementary schools. And the reason for this is by the time kids are in high school, they can have jobs. We do a lot of fundraising in high school, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of movement when we're thinking about early intervention. We use those funds for elementary schools. But where are we really needing those period products? We're really needing them in secondary. So the funding isn't really in our secondary schools. That's important for us to understand. Um, this is a funny picture. <laughs> but the reason why I chose this picture is when I go to my, these schools from the reservations in Navajo, um, the Navajo reservations in Monument Valley to my rural schools in Tremont and Box Elder, I know not all of these kids are using tampons. I think we think of like menstruation products as tampons. Not a lot of kids, not all kids use that. Not all kids understand that. So when we're thinking of these products, we also need to be thinking of like this equitable idea that 
Some families, especially our refugee families, our immigrant families, tampons isn't it, guys. I'm the daughter of an immigrant. I really didn't even know how to use a tampon until I was in college. My mom was like, we don't do that. I was like, okay, I don't know, but all right, sure. We have many girls in need of period products. And this picture is a courtesy from um, the New York Times um, article, Tackling Period Poverty. Scotland is the first nation to make sanitary products free. This was in November 2020, which is really awesome. So here are the big picture facts, and I'll wrap it up. Seven out of 10 girls miss school due to a lack of access to period products. 10 to 15% of girls start periods by age seven, and 90% start by age 13 well before they are able to have a job to purchase their own products. If girls aren't in school, they aren't learning. Period. <laughs> I wanted to end with this picture. I just want to tell you, I told my husband many times, I was like, I don't think I can do it today. I can't do it today. I can't be here talking about periods. <laughs> I just can't do it when I know this darling girl in my community as a black person in Utah died by suicide because of bullying due to racism and ableism. She had a disability. And I kept thinking to myself, are we missing the mark here? Because I mean, from Susan's wonderful um, message, we're missing the mark a lot, right? and things here, and I'm like, should I be here talking about periods? My community needs me. I need to be talking about racism. I need to be talking about ableism. Those are the places that I need to be. And I realize it's not an either or, but it's an and. We have to talk about period products. We have to talk about racism. We have to talk about sexism. We have to talk about all of these things because all of it matters. And I just wanted to end with common sense. So thank you so much.